The next matter before the court is Palmer versus Bowers. Counsel, will there be everyone present? Yes. Are you waiting for anyone? I believe everybody's here. Everybody's here. Well, then, yes, with sir. pleasure, we can, we can proceed. And you can reserve up to five minutes if you let me know. I would like to do that, Your Honor. And I will give you a high five when you're there. Very good. I appreciate right. that. That's the one thing I have trouble with these oral arguments. I have trouble interrupting, so that's the way to do it. Okay. Very good. I appreciate that. Uh, may it please the court, my name is uh, Timothy Fitzgerald. I represent the appellant, uh, in this case, Richard Palmer. Uh, Mr. Palmer is a 15% uh, shareholder in a corporation called Hall Contracting Services, Inc., which operates on, uh, on a facility on Pinnell Parkway uh, in Avon uh, Lake, Ohio. It is a company uh, that for many years has been involved in the uh, uh, installation, maintenance, servicing of uh, printing presses primarily for newspapers, which I think we can all um, recognize is probably a, a, uh, a dying uh, industry at this point in time, and that, that's what the Hall Contracting does. Uh, this case arises out of a derivative lawsuit that Mr. Palmer filed uh, against uh, about a half, actually about a half of Hall Contracting and its other uh, shareholders against uh, uh, a number of individuals, um, uh, Robert uh, Bowers, like Judith Bowers and uh, Graham Hall, uh, who were uh, at various times either shareholders or directors uh, of, of Hall Contracting. Uh, and the dispute in this case uh, primarily involves uh, the ownership of shares that at one point in time were owned by Graham Hall. Uh, there was uh, a transaction that took place in which uh, those shares were, were transferred in what we refer to in this case uh, as a step transaction uh, in order to make an effort to comply with terms of a majority, majority shareholder agreement that uh, governed all of the shareholders uh, in Hall Contracting, uh, except for Robert Bowers. He was not a, uh, a party to the underlying majority shareholder agreement. I don't think it's necessary for the court to really delve into uh, the minutia uh, of, of the facts arising out of the majority shareholder agreement and uh, compliance with it and the dispute that uh, is really the, the, the basis uh, for the lawsuit. Uh, the issue that is before the court today involves an order uh, by the trial court approving uh, the sale of uh, what, what probably is almost all of the assets uh, of Hall Contracting uh, Services uh, without compliance uh, with the Ohio corporate law that uh, covers uh, the sale of what uh, under the statute is uh, all or substantially all assets uh, of a corporation. And, and that uh, statute is uh, revised code section 1701.76 subsection uh, A1. I'll get into the, uh, the terms of, of that uh, statute here in a moment. But I, I think it is uh, uh, the easiest way of resolving uh, this appeal is with what is in the, at this point in time uh, undisputed facts. And what are those undisputed facts? The undisputed facts are that there has yet to be any uh, notice of a shareholder meeting in contemplation of the sale of substantially all of the assets of all contracting. Uh, there has yet to be a meeting of the shareholders uh, to either approve or disapprove of the sale of substantially all of the assets of all contracting. Uh, there's been no shareholder approval of that uh, transaction. And there has been no director uh, action uh, to approve and to effectuate the sale of substantially all of the assets of all contracting services. Well, and isn't that uh, prohibited by the agreed entry that uh, was entered into? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, uh, Judge Moore. That, that is one of the, the uh, underlying factors. And, and I think the way uh, we can look at this case is in, in two ways. Uh, one of which is uh, the question of whether or not uh, revised Code 1701.76A1 uh, has been complied with? Uh, and the answer to that is no. And I think that is the end of the inquiry here, because without compliance with that statute, uh, the sale or post sale of the property on Pin Pin Oak Parkway and all of the uh, inventory and uh, other assets that uh, were, were at that 
facility uh, means that the trial court had no authority to approve that sale. Uh, in other words, the trial court has no uh, discretion, has no authority uh, to act uh, in, in approving the sale of uh, substantially all of the assets of all contracting services unless there has been compliance with the Ohio corporate law. And I don't think anyone is going to get up here today and dispute the fact that 1701.76A1 was not complied with here. Now, why it wasn't complied with may be a different issue, but I, I think for purposes of, of this appeal, the court doesn't need to concern itself with whether or not there's a reason or justification for why it wasn't complied with. The fact it wasn't complied with is more than enough uh, legal reason uh, for the court to have denied the, uh, the proposed sale, and it is the very reason why this court needs to reverse the trial court's decision. Now take us through the, um, because there seems like there, there's quite a bit going on in this. Absolutely. Um, I understand from reading the briefs that motions for summary judgment were filed and the court ruled upon those um, against your client. Okay. On certain aspects. On these aspects. Correct. Right. Um, those uh, entries are not a part of the record before us, is that correct? Well, I understand that there was a motion, and you know what, we've had several cases uh, set for today, and I want to, I don't want to speak, but is this the case in which there was a motion filed to supplement the record with those orders, and this court uh, overruled that motion? Yes. What was sought to be supplemented was the summary judgment briefing. The summary judgment briefing and the trial court's order on summary judgment had already uh, been issued at the point in time when the court approved the sale. So, so that is part of the record. What was uh, attempted to be supplemented was uh, after we had appealed from the order approving uh, the sale, uh, there were motions filed primarily by uh, the Bowers defendants uh, to vacate the agreed uh, injunction that prohibited Mrs. Bowers from uh, voting her shares or conducting uh, a shareholder meeting. So the motions for summary judgment and the, the memorandum are part of the record? Yes, yes they are. And the court's ruling on yeah, that? Yes. Oh, the, okay. the, the, approved, uh, the order approving the sale uh, was June 4th, 2014. Uh, the summary judgment order uh, was May 16th, 2014. So all the briefing would have been done well in advance. I think it was early 2014 when the briefing was completed on the summary judgment. Uh, and the, order, the summary judgment order came out in, in May, roughly a month before the order approving uh, the sale of, of the property. So, uh, again, uh, we, we can debate uh, whether or not uh, there is still a dispute as to whether or not Mrs. Bowers owns these shares. Uh, it is our position that that issue remains in dispute regardless of the summary judgment ruling by the trial court that said that the majority shareholder agreement provisions were all complied with, uh, which was adverse. Now, why is that? Be because what remains in this case, uh, and it, it is primarily uh, uh, claims that uh, exist between uh, Graham Hall and, and the Bowers defendants, is that the issue of ownership of those shares is still in dispute. In other words, uh, the Bowers defendants claim and, and argue in successfully in opposing Graham Hall's motion for summary judgment that, uh, that the transaction where they bought Graham Hall's shares uh, uh, is subject to being uh, rescinded on the, on the basis of lack of consideration. They argued that when they bought those shares, they wanted the shares free and clear. They didn't get a free and clear uh, title to the, the, the shares. Therefore, they, 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 may, they may not want the shares. Moreover, uh, the Bowers have, have not fully paid for the shares that they claim to have bought from, from Graham Hall. And because of that, Graham Hall uh, still retains the ability uh, to rescind uh, the, the transaction itself. There's a, actually, there's a statute in Ohio, a revised code 1308.30A1, uh, which is a security uh, statute that provides that uh, when uh, consideration for a, a share transaction has not been paid, the, the seller of those shares can rescind that transaction. And all of those claims have been retained in this case. In other words, how, how is it that your client can raise that issue? How do you have standing to raise that? That, that is between
between um, Bowers and uh, whoever the other uh, athlete is. Correct. Right, Grandma. Right. That, that, that is true, but it is a, a claim that, that muddies the, the question of who is the owner of, of those shares. And, uh, uh, for example, if, if the Bowers defendants and Graham Hall dismissed those claims and said, well, we're not going to pursue those uh, claims in this case, then, then perhaps that would be a different issue. But the, the outcome in this case still remains uncertain as to who, who owns those shares. The trial court has not yet determined, and in fact denied Graham Hall's motion for summary judgment, where he said, I sold you my shares, uh, uh, Judy Bowers. You owe me the money for those shares. And they argued successfully that, that, is, that Graham Hall was not entitled to summary judgment because there's a question as to whether or not the Bowers want those shares. They, they, they've raised the argument of lack of consideration for the transaction. So. Until that claim gets resolved, there is a cloud as to who owns the, the, the shares, uh, which means that any buyer uh, of the, of the uh, assets of Hall Contracting uh, can't get clean, clear title to that property until that, that issue is resolved. So I, I think that's why, I, as I started my argument today, I said there's two ways that this case can, can be resolved. One is the clear-cut uh, application of the statute 1701.76A1. And when you find that that statute has not been complied with, regardless of why, the trial court didn't have the authority to authorize the, the sale of uh, substantial all, all contract. So is your contention that all this other stuff needs to be resolved first before we can either sell or not sell the property? Yes. And you know you are hoping to find it. Then I, I will. Gladly reserve the rest of my time. Yes, you have three Thank minutes. you. Thank Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Janine Pereira, and I'm here on behalf of the police, Robert Bowers, Judith Bowers, and Paul Contract. Appeals a single order permitting home contracting to sell the building it owns and depositing the net proceeds of in escrow until fourth order order of the court. Helen argues that the building and equipment comprises substantially all of the assets of home contracting and should not be sold absent a shareholder's vote. Helen does not cite any portion of the transcript to substantiate its assertion that home contracting would be selling substantially all of its assets. Helen does not explain what home contracting owes and if and how the building supports its position that the building comprises substantially all of the assets. Helen isn't being clear about what Hall contracting, Hall contracting was selling pursuant to the sales purchase agreement that was attached to the motion to sell the property. In Are addition, the purchase in the record of any support for the argument that the appellant made about answers that Hall gave during discovery that it was not um, considering uh, selling these assets uh, and uh, then later um, through discovery information was uh, released that suggested that that uh, the company was in fact engaged, had engaged a real estate uh, agent. Well ironically plaintiff himself when he was president of all contracting services looked into selling the building. It's kind of been a long-standing issue. The um, question I think that you're pertaining to was during the motion of the hearing regarding the order appointing a receiver, and they had asked the treasurer certain questions, but I don't know that they asked her directly whether she was planning on selling the building, and I don't know that she would know that. Certainly the owner would have known that, but it's not like you're hiding anything. I mean, we brought forth the purchase agreement when we um, received it. Well, the brief suggested uh, that her answers were that, no, we're not, we don't have any uh, plans to sell. And we would dispute that based on the record as a whole. Well, we have that information in the record. Yes. Okay. Because even the court, as I recall, uh, suggested that some of the things that were coming out uh, did not pass the smell test. That was initially during the original um, temporary restraining order that was based on Palmer's ability to say that his ability to 
establish that he would have a claim that he was likely to succeed upon. And of course, after the motion for summary judgment, we feel that that's not the case because the court determined that the shares were transferred pursuant to a proper amendment of the majority shareholder agreement. So that those are two separate things. And that was very, that was in the initial phase of the case. I think that was probably just a couple of days after the complaint was filed. In addition to the purchase agreement, this attached to the motion to sell property has long since been revoked due to the concern that all contracting might not be able to convey to their title to the property due to this litigation. However, a subsequent purchase offer by a different entity has been circulated between the parties. Nevertheless, we feel that this, dis that this appeal should be dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. The instant appeal centers on a simple interlocutory order because it does not resolve all the issues and the claims of this litigation. It's not a final appeal for order. Contrary to appellant's assertion, this is not an ancillary proceeding. It does not aid in the outcome of appellant's derivative dispute or all contracting's counterclaim that appellant is in breach of his contractual obligation to permit all contracting to receive his shares pursuant to the termination call option. The order simply deals with the sale of a corporate building that no longer suits all contracting's needs. It's just too big of a facility. So you're saying it's too big, um, not that Paul was required to sell that in order to continue to meet their financial obligations? Well, I mean, that's another thing. It would certainly assist with our ability to meet its financial obligations and remain in business. Further, neither the appellant nor Hall contracting would be divested of all the rights to the property at issue. The order specifically states that the net sale proceeds shall be deposited with the clerk of courts pursuant to a further order of the court. To the extent that the appellants prevail on any claim, which we don't think will occur due to the court's subsequent ruling for the motion for summary judgment, the sale of the shares, the building would not impact the transfer of shares back to Hall and McKenzie. And similarly, the appellant can sue in any monetary damages of the funds that would be held with the clerk of courts. At a minimum, the appeal is premature. The appellant's will argument is that the trial court erred by permitting the sale of the building as to the shareholder's vote. However, as the appellant properly pointed out, they were actually preventing this the shareholders vote from occurring. We filed a motion to vacate the agreed temporary restraining order. They've opposed it. It's before the trial court at this minute. But, or, that, but that motion is not a part of our record. Correct. But that's part of the our argument that it's an interlocutory order and that the whole case should be before the court of appeals at once. Well, we can, we can as a court, consider matters that are not uh, a part of the record for us in determining movements, but as I understand your argument, it's that if we were to uh, remand this matter to the court to rule on the motion to vacate, depending on how the court ruled, if the court granted the motion, it, it might be or it would be correct. It could be moved. moved. Correct. But that's something different from the matter is actually moved at this point. Correct. Okay. And more than that, appellant does not claim any irreparable harm. It's a shareholder's derivative suit where this isn't a claim for specific performance. It doesn't involve the price of sale of the OMA. It involves the building that's only one of the assets that all contracting owns and no longer suits its needs. Moreover, appellant does not cite any specific concern regarding the sale of this particular building. He's not cited to any need for this building to remain as all contracting property. Well, but wasn't there an emergency motion filed in the court below uh, with regard to the sale of this building? Correct. And, you know, because you're, you're maybe this is just what I'm hearing, almost painting a picture that this is just during the normal course of business and this no longer suited our needs, but it, it, it's sounding like from the record before us that, you know, you're struck, the company's struggling to, to keep its head above water. Correct, and this would greatly help with that effort. Okay. You know, it's interesting because Appellant argues that all contracting is in horrible financial consideration, then it begs the question, why then are they preventing us from selling this building? It would free up capital for us to allow for operating expenses and to proceed to move forward. Well, the, the, the briefing uh, suggests that that was the whole purpose for the derivative uh, action was because the company's finances were being mismanaged. And so the appellant appears to be suggesting that um, the court needed to take a look at 
the, the, the total picture, not just the discrete sale of this building. But again, the only part of that to be for the at this time. So nevertheless, the sale of the building will not impact Apollo's ability to pursue his claims, even if the appellant were to succeed on the merits of his claims to trial court in order the return of the Judith Power shares to call Paul and Mackenzie, an appellant could then pursue a claim for money damages. The sale of the building has nothing to do with that. And in closing, I'd just like to point out that Judith Powers is a shareholder of record. So uh, we don't believe that appellant has any standing to discuss any sale of the shares between Mackenzie Hall and Powers. We do have more than six minutes left if you feel you want to continue, but I'm Thank you. Just want to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. If I could. Yeah, all right. Hey, please, the court. My name is Fritz Berkmiller. I'm counsel for Graham Hall, uh, another FLE. I'll be brief. I won't use much time at least time. But I think an important point to pass along with respect to this order is that it's not purely an order to sell the building. It is to then place any net proceeds into escrow. This was an important point for my client, Graham Hall. His name obviously is on the company's masthead. It's still called Hall Contractor, but he is separate from Hall Contractor. And he has divested himself of shares in the transaction as Mr. Fitzgerald knows is still under litigation. But nonetheless, we're separate from that. It was when the motion was put forward, it was important to him response was made, you know, we did oppose, but then we also noted in the alternative that you're going to grant this, at the very least you should put these proceeds into escrow, uh, which is why we're here today, uh, I guess in defense of the order, because we do believe that at least to that extent they got it right. Uh, I think the issue uh, of whether or not this appeal is moot, I think you have accurately pointed out, maybe it's not moot right now, uh, but I do go back to the prematurity of this, in that there are motions under consideration still in front of the trial court that would make this move, and thus it is premature right now. But I think the more important point to take away and what I'll end on is this. Uh, Mr. Palmer, the appellant here, is part of the reason why a shareholder's meeting cannot be held. And I think it is inequitable he should be stopped from complaining about that condition because he is in part the reason for it. Uh, I don't think you can come here and say, well, the, they can't hold a meeting and therefore they, they can't do this. Well, but you're part of the reason for that. And well, you can't he, buy the he, court. He's not that. the whole reason. I mean, the, as I understand, there was an agreed entry. Yes. So everyone had to agree, and, and it didn't have any expiration date. And that's well, correct, and it, it binds the parties, but it didn't yeah. bind the court. Doesn't bind the court from changing that order. No, or certainly not. Or anything else, and I think that is a nuance, or not a nuance, but an important point that's being missed in this argument. It wasn't an agreement of the judge. The judge can't buy. This was an agreed order of the parties, and, and uh, I don't think the basis that he's put forth, this lack of meeting, is really any basis at all to withhold the discretion of the trial court. If the building is sold, does it essentially terminate the business? Hall. I can't speak for Hall. I, I could if you would like me to speculate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would not, say I'm no. not Mr. Hall. I just speak to the Hall Consulting whatever the name of the company. Yeah, for Hall. Because essentially they're just done. Yeah. Yeah, I can't speak for Hall Contracting, but I would think that. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what. Okay. From my client's perspective, we'd like to see a resolution of this matter. We'd like to move ahead in a way. I think having funds in escrow. Which you have. No. Yeah. The order would allow the building to be sold and that proceeds to be Oh, paid. I see what you're saying. Yes, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Quickly, it's an agreed order. It's an order. It was agreed to by the parties. The judge signed off on it. It is no different than if the judge had, had done it on his own. The parties came to this uh, consensus that that was what was going to govern the, the case until otherwise modified. And there has been a <coughs> to modify that order. It's been pending for nine months. 
Judge Moraldi has not vacated that order at this point in time. It is still as effective as it has it been then his, his own order. Well, could he? Absolutely. There, well, there, he couldn't while the case was pending before us. I, I think he can. There's been no argument made that he is divested of jurisdiction over the, 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 the agreed order. The only thing he is divested of is the order approving the, 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 the sale. He, he, he still has jurisdiction over any other aspect of the case. Uh, so could it become moot? I suppose it could, just like any other appeal could become moot. Uh, the, the problem is, is that you know once it becomes uh, an approved sale, uh, then the appeal can, can never be pursued. I mean, that's why this is a final appeal of the order. Um, a question was raised as to whether or not this is substantially all of the assets and the argument was made by Ms. Capera that uh, somehow we don't know what the assets are. We know the Pinot Pin Parkway property, the real estate is being sold. There is a, a the proposed purchase agreement is attached to their quote, emergency uh, motions is to sell. They are selling uh, office equipment. They are selling a crane. They, they are selling, uh, Judge Schaefer, in answer to your question, this liquidates Hall contracting. And, and that's exactly what Robert Bowers has been doing systematically since he took over this company in September of 2012. He basically came in and, and cleaned house, and, and this is the last step in that, in that process, and what he is doing is he is transferring all of this to his wife's company, uh, JEB uh, Properties, I think it's called, which is a company out in Colorado. He is systematically liquidating to the detriment and prejudice of every other shareholder in this company the assets of, of, of the company, and he's doing it under the after having sat in this, not in this particular courtroom, but in this courthouse during the receivership hearing. And Judge Moore, you asked about evidence as to whether or not there was testimony at the receivership hearing about the plans to sell Hall Contracting's building. Yes, Mrs. Uh, 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 Judith Beiser, the, the financial uh, officer of the company, was asked, are there any plans to sell the, the, the real estate? And she, she's an officer of the company now, said no, there is no plan. Robert Bauer sat in the gallery and, and listened to that testimony and was subsequently called to testify in the case and he never clarified that that was incorrect. In fact, for months, Mr. Bowers had been negotiating to sell the, the real estate at Hall Contracting and despite the fact that there had been testimony in the case from his own officer, his financial officer, that that, that was not taking place. Now, I'm not saying Ms. Beiser was lying. Maybe she was kept in the dark as well. But the fact of the matter is, there is evidence in the record. It's all part of the, the opposition to their motion for an emergency receiver or a, it's authorized to sell the property that he had been negotiating the sale of this property for several months. And so this, to, to come in here and act as though this is somehow you know, a surprise of uh, we need an emergency order from the court. We have this recent offer. They've been negotiating with these buyers for months. Now you need to conclude. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one last uh, under advisement and send you a copy of the written opinion when it is issued. We may also uh, find the opinion on our website. Thank you and have a good Thank day. Thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned until Thursday.